All right, welcome to week five, everybody. Um, we're almost at the break, which is nice. Um, first thing I'm going to tackle is I'm going to talk about the midterm really quick. Just spend like three minutes, just so that everybody is up to date. I just updated the announcement to make sure it was correct. It is happening October nineteenth at five, basically here. And well, now in two weeks. Um, essentially, it's covering weeks one to five, really. Well, week six is just a review. So when it says covers weeks one to six, it's basically, you know, weeks one to five plus any odds and ends I might touch on next week. Uh, no hybrids on the midterm, which is nice. It is now in two pieces. Uh, the decision came down from up on high that there now has to be a written component in all computer assessments. Um, so there's two pieces. Uh, there's 35 multiple choice questions, which you're gonna be answering on Scantron. And then um, it says you'll have up to three short essay questions. By short essay, I don't mean you're gonna be writing a novel. Um, actually, you have the pick of four, and you have to pick, yeah. You have to answer two out of four. We're giving you four questions. You pick two you feel comfortable answering. Um, there's a couple of um, what is, the two of them are type of you know what is important about this, and you basically write your what you think about it. Uh, there's one choice where it's doing a diagram, and one choice which is normalization, which is what I'm going to be teaching today. Um, I'm actually 100 sure about that percentage, about the 15 percent. I have to go double check. Um, I'm pretty sure that whoever wrote the midterm originally decided to cut back because it was supposed to be 45 questions and three answered, but he went down to 35 questions and two answered. So uh, I have to double check those percentages. Uh, you will have 75 minutes plus five minutes grace period. That means if you come in up to five minutes late, you still get to write um, and, you know, past the end of the five minutes. Um, essentially, in effect, you have 80 minutes to write the test which is more than adequately fair. Uh, the university standard, not college standard, university standard at Canada is 30 seconds per multiple choice question. The college standard is 45 seconds per multiple choice question. Um, you're getting, you know, 35 questions in 75 minutes plus two short answer jobs. So you're getting almost a minute and a bit per multiple choice question. It's, it's adequate. Um, it's going to be on Scantron. I don't know if any of you have experienced Scantron before. You're going to bring an HP pencil and a really good eraser. Uh, Scantron's anal retentive. Um, I'll be giving you guys some tips on how to fill a Scantron sheet next week when I don't have... As long as it's a white one, rubber one, it's probably okay. Um, you may need a sharpener in case you want to keep your pencil nice and sharp. Um, it's closed book. That means that, you know, there'll be nothing on the desk with you except for your pencils. And maybe a pen if you want to do your diagrams and stuff in pen. Students that have Cal accommodations. And this semester is the largest number of Cal accommodations I've ever had between the two groups. Um, I've currently had three people book. I've got 25 ac accommodations out of, uh, out of 150 students. That's a lot of accommodations for that percentage. So I should be expecting significantly more because you will be not given the extra time that your Cal accommodation letters say if you're in the classroom. So you have to book through Cal. Um, that's all I've got to say about that. So if you're supposed to get extra time, you have to go through Cal to get the extra time. Uh, they will give you a reasonable test environment. It's usually pretty quiet in there. Uh, they'll be able to call me if something goes horribly wrong. And that's that. Okay, any quick questions about this? I will go, if anybody has heavy duty questions, I'll answer them next week because that'll be the last week before the test. But I figured I'd give the most detail now so you guys can focus on your your work. Okay, going once, twice, three times, done. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do really quick is I know 
most of you have already dealt with MySQL Workbench this week. It's been a fun time for everybody involved. Um, for those of you that have not or are struggling trying to get certain things to happen, I'm going to do a, like a quick little demo. When you launch MySQL Workbench, it looks like this. To create a new diagram, you're going to go on the left, this right here. You see my mouse right over here. That'll bring this up. You click the plus next to model, and then you have to add a diagram. It'll bring you to your diagramming window. If you've ever used any kind of diagramming tools, most of this will feel familiar, except how shitty it is. Um, anybody who uses multiple monitors at home, do this for shits and giggles. Take this, start a diagram on your primary monitor, drag it to your second monitor. Tell me what happens. Uh, at least at my machine at home, with my, you know, RTX 3060 Ti, it actually crashes. Yeah, I've got a 9, 9, 32 gigs of RAM and a 3060 Ti and it's just a bed. I don't know. I don't know if it's my video card, video driver, the fact that I've got three monitors. I don't know what it is. But all I know is if I bring it to the left or I bring it to the right, it hangs instantly. It's my skill workbench. It just sucks. So you're going to be working on your primary display. All right. So the various tools you're going to use is this one right here to place a new table. You, you just plunk it wherever you want. I'm going to throw on a second table so I can show you guys some of the behaviors that this will do. I'm going to add some columns to the first table. How did I do that? I double clicked on it. I'm going to call this table one because I'm well, actually it already is table one. Yay. I'm going to add a primary key. It defaults to whatever defaults that you have set. If you did the lab one properly, it will default to ID. Otherwise, it will default to ID table, whatever. And it will automatically mark it as the primary key if you put it in the first field. After that, you can keep adding fields by clicking on the next field or double click. And we're going to call this name. I was going to leave it as a varkar 50. We can mark it as not null or whatever. Yeah, varkar 40. And this one, email as rule is 150 in my world. And I'll leave it nullable. So that means email is optional. That covers several items from the conceptual diagram. The other items that are left for you guys to know how to use is the relationships. You can make a relationship non-identifying or identifying. Um, essentially what works is you pick a relationship, you click on the child table, click on the parent table, it'll create the relationship for you and create the foreign key. It also makes sure that it has the right data type because foreign keys should have always have the same data type as the parent. If you create a relationship and as long as the one to many sides are set correctly. Uh, you can always adjust it to be identifying or not, or optional, that kind of thing. Uh, if it's not what you wanted, you click on it and you can hit the delete key or right click and delete. That'll get rid of it. Um, if you double click, you'll see a thing that looks like this. Under foreign key, you can turn it into an identifying relationship. You will notice right here, if you pay attention to this little pink dot, when I make it identifying, it turns into a key because now the foreign key is participating in the primary key. And you can choose to make a table mandatory or not. And if you hit that button, a lot of people are like, well, I'm making things mandatory, not nothing's changing. Are you ready for the magic trick? I clicked somewhere else. I clicked somewhere on the diagram and suddenly the optional bubble, the circle shows up. Why is it that if I make something identifying, the key changes immediately, but if I make it optional, it doesn't update immediately? You've got me. Um, but that is pretty much everything you guys need to know about this. Um, the only other items in here really you need to worry about would be uh, picking appropriate data types. Um, for example, if I was talking about a price, I'd recommend you use a decimal. And this being special software, if you pick decimal and you try to do it from the drop down, it gives you an error. But if you type it in, it works just fine. Um, hell if I know why. It's this software. Um, 
It's because if you work with MySQL in the industry, this is what you're probably going to be using unless your employer is prepared to spend three grand on proper ERD software, which most employers will not. Yeah, pretty much. So just hope you don't have to work with MySQL. <laughs> All right, so that's that's the long and short of MySQL Workbench, how to do a diagram really quick. Nothing special in here. Um, the other thing that that is handy to show for you guys, um, I'm just going to throw in a primary key in here just for like that so that there's something there. Is there's also a many to many tool, which if I go many to many, it actually creates the bridging table automatically for you. So if you need to create an intersection table or a, a relation, uh, a uh, associative table, you can use many to many by just going click on one, click on the other, and it creates it for you. That's pretty much the only good feature it has. Um, the other piece you guys will want is under file. Export export as PNG. Because if you take a screenshot, depending on what kind of screen resolution you're running, it's either going to go really well for me or I won't be able to read it. I've had that where people took just took a screenshot and then it comes in, it's they're running a 4K monitor, so everything's like that big. But believe it or not, when you take the screenshot, it's going to come out the same you know, DPI as your display is. Or it comes in like big chunky fonts. Um, use the export, it works better. And you go export, you give it a file name, and like whatever. And if I drop to my desktop, it'll be there, just like what was there before. Okay. Any questions about that? Quick and dirty little demo. I basically spent six six minutes doing it. The link I provided to everybody on the announcements was seven minutes long. I think I covered pretty much the same amount of detail. Um, all right. Since it's silence, I am going to dive into this week's uh, lecture material. It is historically one of the topics students have the hardest time understanding. And it's one of those topics that either we spend three weeks doing, or we spend one, uh, one, one and a half hours doing. There's no in between. I'll give you a guess which version you guys are getting. You're getting the hour, hour, 15 minutes version. Um, the thing is, is that you guys are getting a very, um, what's, what's the word, very broad, but not deep introduction to database. So that means that we have to cover a lot of topics. Um, Normalization is important that you understand how what its goals are and roughly what your te the techniques are to use it. Um, once you get it, you get it. It's like one of those things that you're going to be going, I don't understand, until one day it just goes click. Which is, you know, why some schools spend three weeks on it. But then again, they, you also won't get SQL in the, in the same course. You'll get database design from start to end. And SQL as a second course. Therefore, then we'd be have time to spend three weeks on this so that everybody gets it. Um, okay. I'm just going to skip the objectives. So the scenario, and I meant to get rid of this slide. Oh, I have one other piece of news that's important. Uh, if anybody had looked at these slides on Brightspace before Tuesday, and then you compare them to today, you'll notice there's about 10 slides less. The course lead agreed to drop pretty much one entire topic. And so we went from 20% of the slides on one topic to two slides. Because it really was not that important and it was such a waste of time to go over it. Um, and we don't even test you guys on it. So there was no point spending 25% of a lecture on something you're not going to get tested on. So. It's good news. It's 19 slides now. 29 slides, not 31 or something like that. Anyways, so we basically you were you're given a couple of one or more tables of existing data. The data is to be stored in a new database, and the question usually is, do we store it as it was given? Uh, usually, the answer is no. It probably needs to be transformed. 
um, so that it actually follows proper normalization rules. So we're, we're going to go through a process called database normalization. It's a process to organize the database into tables and columns. Okay, well, so far we've been talking about tables and columns basically for two, you know, last two weeks, more or less. But this is the process of taking raw data that comes out in the, from the wild and designing it to fit into a database properly. The idea is that a single table in a database should be about a specific topic and only, it should only contain the columns that have to do with that topic. So if we have a table in the system for students, there shouldn't be other information in that table except information specific to students. And by that, I mean like people's names, date of birth, that kind of thing. Not, there shouldn't be a course low, a course description, what courses a person takes or any of that. It should just be information about a student. When we limit a table to just one purpose, known as a topic, uh, you tend to reduce the number of duplicate data. And the less duplication of data you have, the more likely your database will be stable. Um, it's going to avoid uh, issues coming from database modifications. Um, so in order to achieve a goal of a single topic per table, rules were created. And those rules are known as the normal forms. We will be concentrating on the first, second, and third normal forms. Uh, we will take a parting shot on the way by on something called Boyce Cod, where literally that went from, you know, 12 slides to two or something like that. So, you know, once, once to, we're just going to kind of mention that it exists. Okay. So why do we want to normalize data? The first purpose is to uh, minimize duplicated data. When we update a database, we want to do it in one place and only one place. So if we need to change a person's phone number, we want to do it in one place, not in three places. The second purpose is to avoid uh, data modification issues. These are known as data anomalies. Uh, we're actually going to be spending three, four slides on anomalies. And the third is to usually simplify queries, even though it might make your queries more What's the word I'm looking for? Longer? Conceptually, they'll be simpler. Um, you'll understand what I mean after the break about simplifying your queries. Um, so we got a table below. It's called sales staff. And in here, we have an employee ID and a bunch of information going with it. And this table has a few problems. When we look at it, we'll notice that the primary key is underlined. So employee ID has been underlined. The first thing you notice that it serves many purposes, including it identifies the organization's salespeople. It lists sales offices and the phone numbers. It associates a salesperson with a sales office, and it shows each salesperson's customers. So essentially, this one table serves three or four different topics at the same time. So we got the sales reps, we got some sales offices, we have the customers, and as it's laid out, if we want to add a fourth customer for a given sales rep, we'd actually have to modify the table and add another column. It's not great. So when it serves too many purposes, we have issues like data duplication, update issues, and increased effort to query the data because you end up having to create, create quite complex where clauses. So the filters have to be quite complex. Um, all right, so data duplication is a pretty straightforward concept. We don't want to duplicate data. If you need to change data in more than one place, there's always a risk that something's going to go horribly wrong. With today's computers, they're all pretty fast. Like, you know, as, as crappy as some of us feel our computers might be, Compared to what we were dealing with in the 80s and the 70s and, you know, early 90s, yeah, you got nothing compared to that. Those were terrible days. But it used to be that database updates took so long that if you had to update multiple rows for the same thing, that there was always a risk that it would never finish. So you're updating three or four things and suddenly the server crashes. Now you've got your data in a state of limbo um, or back really back in the day, the tapes would break. You know, server's still running, but the tape's busted. You know, there's things that happened. Um, so 
duplicate information presents two problems. It increases storage and it decreases performance. So if you duplicate a lot of stuff, it takes up more room. And if you duplicate a lot of stuff, that means it's got to search through more stuff. Therefore, it's going to be slower. Um, it becomes more difficult to maintain data changes because the more you have, the more places you have to do changes, the more risky it is. Um, so in table one here, um, it was saying that the sales office, the office number were both listed. Um, it's literally duplicating the sales office information for each sales rep. It's not great. All right. So a modification anomaly. If we were to move the Chicago office to Illinois, to properly reflect this in our table, we'd have to update entries for all the salespeople that are currently in Chicago. Now, the sample table, which I'm going to jump back to again, really, we only have two rows, but if we had, you know, 500 sales reps, and let's say we got 100 in Chicago, we'd have to update 100 rows just to change the phone number of this, the office and to change the name of the office. Also, if John Hunt quits, we've got a second row right here, and we delete this row, we're going to lose the fact that New York exists. That's a deletion anomaly. So an update anomaly is when you have to update multiple rows of data for a single change. A delete anomaly, anomaly is when you delete a row and you're losing unrelated information. It just disappears. So not only would we lose the New York office, we'd also lose Dell, HP, and Apple with customers. It's not good. Um, those are known as modification anomalies. So there's three types of modification anomalies. Uh, there's insert, update, and delete. I'm just going to skip saying anomaly every time. On an insertion anomaly, um, there's basically things we cannot put in the table until we know information for the entire table. So for example, we want to add a new sales office. With the current layout, we couldn't add a new sales office unless we already have an employee for that sales office. Therefore, what's happening is to be able to add one piece of data to the database, you have to add other stuff to support it. That's not even related. Like, who cares who the sales rep is? They have nothing to do with the Atlanta office. Therefore, we want to be able to put the Atlanta office without having to have the sales rep. But we can't do that because right now, the employee ID is the primary key. This is known as an inser insertion anomaly, where we have to insert unrelated data to get the data into the database. So we add something, but we need to add three or four more things. It would be like, everybody's out in the hall. I come into the room, but I'm not allowed to come into the room unless one of you is in here already. But you're not allowed to come in here unless I'm in here. Are you getting the visual the visual issue? Right? I, I can't come in unless one of you is in here, but you can't come in here unless I'm already here. Therefore, we have an insertion anomaly into the room because we need to basically both walk in at the exact same time for that condition to be met. Yeah, we theoretically could do that with a database where we fill the whole row, but the problem is that we have an anomaly where we can't put one without the other. Modification anomaly. That happens when you need to change data in multiple places at once. So we want to change the phone number for Chicago. We have to change it in multiple places. Realistically, you don't want to do that. You just want to change it in one place. And this is all stuff that gets resolved as part of uh, normalization. Okay. And are we going to talk about deletion anywhere in here? Okay, well, deletion already described what happens. You get deletion anomaly. If we fire John Hunt, we just lose all the information tied with him. So that's a deletion. Okay, so this leads us to the closest to math you're going to see in this course. Functional dependencies. So way back in the day when the, con the core concepts of relational database systems were being created, um, a, new, a whole new field of mathematics was created just for it. It was known as relational algebra. And 
the data scientist in question I created, his name was CJ Date. Uh, his book is considered the book when it comes to understanding what databases do on the inside. Um, I've seen it. I actually had it with one of my textbooks when I went through school, and it has not changed. There's a section in the middle about relational algebra that's about 400 pages long. And I don't remember any of it. Just going to put it out there because I'm pretty sure I slept through that whole section of the course. Um, college, you know. So, but there are a few things that came out of that that are important to know. The first one is a functional dependency. A functional dependency occurs when the value of one or more attributes determines the value of a second set of attributes. Um, so for example, and this is actually a really bad example, but um, I'll be doing better examples later. In this case, the cost of cookies is equal to number of boxes times five, times five bucks. Therefore, number of boxes determines the cost of cookies. Therefore, the cost of cookies is dependent on number of boxes. The attribute on the left side of the functional dependency is called the determinant. Functional dependency may be, may be used on equations. Um, so if you look at the bottom, extended price is equal to quantity times unit price. That's pretty standard piece of math that most of you should understand by now. Not that it's a multiplication, it's basically you go went to buy something at Loblaws and you're buying three boxes of cookies. So three boxes of cookies at $7 is going to be $21. Standard price. But we would express it as quantity comma unit price determines the extended price. So if we were going to take the math that we're used to seeing and turn it into basically relational algebra, it comes into quantity comma unit price in parentheses determines unit price. Um, I'm going to have significantly better examples than this in a bit. So. If we have a table that looks like this, we've got object color, weight, and shape. We can say, hang on, I, wow, loud. Thank you. That's the second she got up, they stopped talking. <laughs> All right, so if we look at this table, and we decide that the object color is the determinant. In other words, the object color determines the rest of the table. We could say the object that determines the weight, the, the object color determines the rate, weight, the object color determines the shape. Therefore, the object color determines weight and shape. So as we are trying to figure out how things are related to each other and figure out our functional dependencies, we would start out by saying, okay, object color determines weight, object color also determines shape, we can then simplify this to a single line saying object color determines weight and shape in parentheses. Then we have composite uh, determinants. And this one's interesting. So a composite determinant is when a determinant of a functional dependency has more than one attributes. For example, student number plus class number determines a grade. We could also say course number to determine a grade, right? So the functional dependency rule is this. If A determines B and C, then A determines it B and A determines C. This is called the decomposition rule. So in other words, if we have, when we have a, like this notation that says, you know, we have a, um, a functional dependency, it's, we can break it down back to its original components. So if we went back to here, where if we had object color is weight and shape, we can also say object color is weight, object color is shape. That's called decomposition of a functional dependency. Therefore, if A determines B and A determines C, therefore A determines B and C, that's known as the union rule. So union rule goes one way, decomposition rule goes the other way. So they serve, they, they go in opposite directions. However, if A and B determines C, that means that neither A nor B can determine C by itself. You need both. 
Therefore, it cannot be decomposed. Because you can't decompose the determinant. You can decompose the stuff to the right of the arrow, but you cannot decompose the determinant, which in the end, the deter determinant may become a primary key when we're doing physical design. Okay. So when are determinant values unique? A uh, determinant value is unique in a relation if and only if it determines every other column in the relation. We're getting a bunch of definitions out of the way before we actually show you guys how to do normalization. So a determinant basically has to determine every other column in the relation. You can't find the determinants of all the functional dependencies simply by looking at unique values uh, in a single column. You actually have to look at the table as a whole. Um, when you are trying to figure out your determinants, hopefully you're given enough data because the, the size of the data set will create limitations on how well you can guess what your determinants are. If you are given just the list of the column names and no data to go with it, it becomes quite difficult to figure out what the determinants are going to be. But if you're given like 20 rows, it probably is a lot easier because then you can find a combination of the columns that make it unique. And it must logically be the determinant. Like you, a person's name is not a good determinant. It should be something that's logical. Okay. So relations are categorized as normal form based on which anomalies or other problems they are subject to. We're only worrying about the first three normal forms for this course. So essentially, we are going to worry about functional dependencies. And essentially, it's first, second, and normal form plus Boyce Cod. Um, Boyce Cod is known informally in the industry, industry as the normal form three and a half uh, because it lives between third and fourth normal forms. So it's like three and a half because it's between three and four. Um, I'll spend two slides on Boyce Cod, uh, but I'll be spending a lot more slides on one, two, three. Um, there's things as, such as multi-valued dependencies. That's what fourth, fourth normal form is for. Uh, data constraints and oddities uh, includes the fifth normal form, uh, DKNF. Um, sixth and seventh normal forms. There's actually like 10 or 12 different normal forms now. Uh, but essentially, everything past the fourth normal form is pocket protector land. Essentially, somebody in university needed to get a, a doctorate written up. So they came up with more normal forms because they, they came up with more edge cases. Some of these edge cases actually happened in the wild before they wrote the dissertations, but you know, for the most part, it's somebody needed to prove how smart they were. Um, realistically, the first three is covers like 90% of database design you're going to need. All right, guides to normalization. Read the business rules carefully. You know, if you have them, great. If you don't, you don't. Uh, only do one step at a time. You don't try to go from first, third, normal form. Don't skip second. Um, but this is the important one. You do not add any data. You don't remove any data, which also means you're not going to add any attributes or remove any attributes. When you're normalizing, you only work with what you're given. Later on, you can start adding extra attributes and extra columns to make it better. But when you're doing the initial normalization, you don't add, you don't take away. Because the process should be reversible. If you started from unnormalized and you went all the way up to third normal form, you should be able to reverse it back to first normal form. You should be able to go backwards and forwards at any given point in time and not lose anything. But if you are removing attributes, you're going to lose stuff. If you're adding attributes, you won't be able to go back because you're actually modifying it. Okay, so normal forms. So not all relations are equal. Um, 
when I'm talking about relations, we're not talking about relationships. We're talking about basically tables of data. Um, some are easy to process, others are problematic. Uh, relations are categorized into their normal forms, depending on what kind of problems that they have. Um, once you understand what the normal forms do and you understand what they solve, uh, it's going to help you make better designs, which is why we try to get this lecture in well before the assignment is due. Um, so there's three normal forms that most databases use, unless you're working with like a NoSQL database, like a non-relational database, then the normal rules just go out the window for those guys. So first normal form. In this case, the information is stored in a relational table and each column contains atomic values. There are no repeating groups of columns. A repeating group of columns, if you go, I'm not going to switch back to it, but if you think back to that little sample of the sales offices where I had customer one, customer two, customer three, that is, you know, A, a repeating column, but that's really what fourth normal form is done to dealt with. Um, I have an example in a bit, but a good example of a repeating uh, group of columns would be something like this. Um, if I've got so right now we have one chunk of data, but in this column we have two values. That's a repeating group of column. I think just this case, the group was only one column, but in theory, I could have, you know, two, three other columns. And if they're repeating multiple times to satisfy part of itself, then that's known as a repeating group of columns. In other words, this ends up being treated as a single value. The problem is that how many values do I have here? Two. Therefore, is, these, is this value atomic? That's not atomic because there's two values. Each of these values must be unique unto itself. Therefore, it's not valid. Therefore, the way you'd fix it, and it's such a stupid thing. And now it's fixed. Yeah, he's shaking his head. But now it's no longer a repeating group of columns because it has a complete row to go with. And so one of the previous lectures, we talked about what makes a valid relation. I forgot to put my phone on do not disturb. It's always it's, it's fun to make fun of the students. It's embarrassing when I'm the one that does it. Anyways. Um, Lost my train of thought. All right, so we talked about what have made a valid relation last week, I think it was. So essentially, what makes a valid relation is that each value is atomic, the row is complete, and to be in first normal form, we have to have a primary key defined. So if I had more data up here, I could probably come up with a primary key. Can't right now, but when I go to do the example, we'll go through it with a proper primary key. Second normal form. A relation is in second normal form if and only if it is in first normal form. It's just like you can't be a super saiyan unless you're a saiyan first. Or you can't evolve whatever Pokemon it is to the next stage unless it was the first stage originally. I don't know enough about Pokemon to actually name off Pokemons, but I know how it works. Um, so you cannot be in second normal form unless you're already in first normal form. And all non-key attributes are determined by the entire primary key. So there are something, there are no partial dependencies. So we have a really terrible example on screen here. Um, so we have a relation that is A, B, N, O, P. And we have a composite key of A, B. That means that 
NOP um, can be determined by A or B. That's the issue that's partial. So a better example is the one below it. So right there, we've got student ID and activity determines the activity fee. Realistically, the activity fee is only def defined by the activity. It has nothing to do with the student ID, right? It's not like if you show up with your student ID, you're going to get a different price than the student that was in front of you or behind you. Everybody pays the same thing for whatever you're doing. Therefore, the activity fee is defined by activity, not by a combination of student ID and activity. Therefore, activity fee is only partially dependent on the entire primary key. This is a partial dependency. To fix it, we have to remove partial dependencies. So in this case, we take out student ID uh, because there should be more fields in there to actually make it make sense, but that's essentially it. Um, third normal form. A relation in the, is in third normal form if and only if is in second normal form. We're continuing with the evolution path here. And there's no non-key attributes determined by another non-key attribute. This is known as a transitive dependency. So I'm going to skip the uh, alphabet soup because it that's, you know, that whole R, A, B, N, O, P thing. It, there's no point. Uh, it'll make more sense when I do the example. Um, but essentially, student housing, student ID, building, building fee. Now, building fee determines, is determined by building. And the building is determined by student ID. So in other words, your student ID says what building you're in. Therefore, the building fee is a transitive dependency because it depends on the building. When I do the examples in a minute, it'll go a lot, it'll make a lot more sense. Okay. So boys code normal form. There's the two slides. Um, if it has more than one candidate key, anomalies could result, result, result even though it's in third normal form. A relation is in Boyce cod if and only if it's in third normal form and every determinant relationship is a candidate key. In other words, it's saying it's possible that when you're doing normalization that you'll have a determinant that is not a candidate key. So Boyce cod says to be in Boyce cod normal form, not only is the, the determinant a determinant, it also has to be a candidate key. Um, in other words, when every attribute or field depends on the key and nothing but the key, that is voice cod. Um, it's to help fix a few issues with functional dependencies. Um, there are times when voice cod is not desirable. An example is zip codes, because zip codes almost never change. Um, anomalies are likely to be caught by business process instead of having to deal with it in the database. So you let you know the business process take care of cleaning up the data. And not having to use SQL to join the data into tables will speed up the processing. In other words, imagine if we had all our zip codes in a separate table based on the addresses. And the only way we could pull out the zip codes was to do joins and it would slow everything down because we're doing extra calls to the database to find out the uh, zip code. All right, this is where we're gonna do the example, which will help make things much more understandable. And I'm going to do it on the board. So we have in here a table of data. It's not a relation because it has repeating groups of columns. So we have an order ID of 1006. We have an order date, customer ID, customer name, an address. And suddenly we have a whole block of repeated rows right here. This is a repeating group of columns. Therefore, it's not in first normal form. It's not even a relation because there are, the rows aren't atomic. They're not completely filled in. So to be in first normal form, we do literally what I did on the board earlier. We just fill in the rest so that we have complete rows. And we also identified the primary key. It was already identified in the previous slide. It shouldn't have been, but you know, 
this is where I'm going to let you guys in a secret. This example here was in a textbook that we used to use for this course. It's the same example they used when I was in school. This has not changed. I'm very familiar with this example. It has. I've been using it for 15 years since I've been teaching this course. And I saw it when I went through school. Actually, I had some PTSD when I saw it. <laughs> so this is a proper relation. So what happened is we filled it all out. <clears throat> we determined the, the primary key, the candidate key, which is order ID plus product ID. And now the combination, the intersection of each column and row has a single value in it. It's unique. There's no repeating groups of rows, which was this. And all the rows are unique and identifiable. So we are going to normalize this. That's <clears throat> where I break out all my colorful markers. Okay. And that's where you all get to see how bad my handwriting is. Order ID. Order date. Customer ID. Customer name. I'm going to start shortening these. Customer address. Product ID. Description. Finish. The description. I think, right? No, price. I already have description. Product, price, and quantity. <laughs> and my writing was getting smaller as I was going because I was running out of room. That's the one reason I hate this room. I don't have enough whiteboards. Okay. So this is our situation right now. We know what our primary, our candidate key is. Combination of order ID and product ID. When we look over at the table over there, you can see that we can identify any given row by the combination of order ID and product ID. You'll notice customer ID has nothing to do with being able to find the specific row. Because 1006 plus 4 will give me the order line, the entire order line. 1006 plus 7 will give me the entire order line. Now, a few anomalies that we'll have in this since we're going to talk about anomalies, and it's an important concept. Before we start diving into second normal form, that fun stuff, what are a few anomalies that you might experience with this? Anybody want to take a guess? What would what, be the um, insertion anomaly? So we want, to add, we want to add a new row to this table. What's the problem? For example, we want to sell a new product. That's exactly it. So that's the insertion anomaly. We And you can't order the product you don't have, and you can't have the product unless somebody ordered it. Back to the problem of student versus Dan coming into the room. Update anomaly. We have a pretty good example of an update anomaly. We want to change the price of the entertainment center. We have to do it in two places. We want to fix the customer's name. We have to do it in three places for the first order alone. That's an update anomaly. A deletion anomaly would be if we deleted the second row. So order ID 1006, product ID 5. We delete that row. We look to the fact that we ever sold a writer's desk or we had the finished cherry available. So by deleting one row, of data, we're losing an entire product. That's a deletion anomaly. So the goal will be to not have that happen anymore by the time we're done normalizing our database. 
So step one, we have the entire row, primary key is defined. Technically, this is one and F. We're in first normal form. That means we're able to pick the entire row and uniquely identify every single row. That's it. That's first normal form. That's the goal of first normal form is we can pull a given row uniquely. We still have all the anomalies are still there, but at least we can at least pull up a single row. So the first thing we need to do is identify our partial dependencies. So a partial dependency is when attributes only depend on part of the key. And right now our key is a combination of order ID and product ID. So the very first thing we'll want to do before we even figure out our partial dependencies is figure out our full dependencies. So what's fully dependent? Because that's the goal. We want all the attributes fully dependent on the entire primary key. So currently, what is the only attribute in here that is fully dependent on the primary key? Yep. No. It's the quantity is the only thing that's fully dependent on the primary key. The customer name depends on customer ID, but the customer ID is not part of the determinant. That will take care of that one in third normal form. So the, currently the thing that is fully dependent is only the quantity. Quantity is fully dependent on the product ID plus the order ID. That is our only fully dependent dependency. So therefore, our partial dependencies will be price, finish, and description is dependent on the product ID. And currently, because the customer ID is not a determinant, customer ID, customer name, customer address, and the order date is dependent on the order ID. So we have two partial dependencies. And how do we fix the partial dependency? We blow it out to its own entity. So now we're going to go to um, second normal form. So right now we had one um, entity originally, one relation. We're going to have three in a moment. Why are we going to have three? Because we have the one that's fully dependent. So that one's safe and good to go. We have two partial dependencies. Therefore, that's one, two, three. So the first one, we're going to call it order. Okay. And then order. Has order. ID, product ID, and quantity. And we know, oh, hang on. I gotta get all my colors up. So we know that this is the primary key, therefore quantity is fully dependent on the entire primary key. Very good. So that was the first one of three. Second one, we're going to call it, uh, actually, this we're going to call it, um, actually, we're going to call it uh, order, this should be order number, and it's order ID. Now I'm going to, let's uh, order L, because I started writing too early for order line. Or actually, you know what, I'll just call it line. There we go. O line. Well, it's the same primary key I had up there. But not I to deal with the partial dependencies. Okay. So I'm also going to create one here called order. And order ID. Order date. Customer ID.
customer name, customer address, like that. This one has only a single primary key because we're taking this blue thing and we're turning it into its own entity. And since now everything is connected to that, we are going to go By the way, when normally you're normalizing, you don't draw the arrow, these colored arrows. I'm just putting it in for you guys as visual aspects. And the last one would be product. And we have the product ID, the product description, the product finish, and the product price uh, that should have been p price like that and again product id is our primary key here and these guys are all depend on that okay so what we've done is we took care of the partial dependencies blew them out to their own relations, their own entities, essentially. So everything that was blue became its own thing because it depended on only part of the primary key. That is also the primary key of the new entities down here. So if you looked at this chunk right here, it's literally this chunk right here. If you look at that chunk right here, it is literally this chunk right here. And this is what was green originally. Okay. So now this is second normal form. So we've now achieved. Where the heck my red marker go? UNF. And just to highlight, since we're trying to achieve um, third normal form, Sometimes when you do this step and you do go from first to second, sometimes you'll accidentally put things in third normal form. For example, this one right now is already in 3 and F. It's also technically in voice code in fourth. Because the attribute depends on the key and only the key. And nothing but the key. Okay? The product down here is also in 3 and F. The order, on the other hand, is in second normal form because we have something called a transitive dependency. And you know what? It took me years to understand what the, why the heck it was called transitive dependency. And then somebody said it, and the student said, I'm like, wow, that's such a great way to explain this. Okay. So the customer address and the customer name is determined by the customer ID, right? Therefore, this is a transparency. The reason why it's called a transitive dependency is this identifier is not part of the primary key. So to get the customer name, you got to go from identifier one, transit through identifier two to get to the value. Therefore, it's transitive because you got to transit through a different attributes. You're going, customer name is determined by customer ID, which is determined by order ID. So if you're looking at a single relation and you can actually say that this is determined by this, which in turn is determined by that. The second you say this is determined by determined by determined, you have a transitive dependency. So because you're transiting through a one determinant, transits through a second determinant to actually identify the end. So how do we fix the transitive dependency? I'll give you three guesses. You, there you go. Yes, yeah, so essentially you'll learn that essentially the way you fix things in normalization is you decompose your relations until you can't break them down any further. And by the time you've broken everything down all the way, you'll probably be at least in three and F and like I said, technically, this one and this one are 3NF. They're also boys' cod. They're also fourth, fifth, and I think DKNF. 
because there's no other anomalies. Once you're taking out all the anomalies, you're basically every normal form, but we'll say we're the third normal form because that's what we're worried about. So I'm going to redo this again over here. So when you're doing the normalization lab and there's a spot that says, you know, normalize, I want you to actually do each of these steps fully. Don't start skipping things. So we're going to come back over here and we are going to go I'm going to start with order, which has the order ID. The order date. And the customer ID. We have a customer. which has the customer ID, the customer name, the customer address, ADDR. We have the product, which has the product ID, the product Description, the product finish, and the product price. And then we have the order line, which has order ID, product ID, and the quantity. And now this is in 3NF. So we went from that to four different entities that are that can't be decomposed any further. So that every every attribute is dependent on the key and only the key and the entire key. What's good about this now is we can add another product without needing an order or a customer. We can change the price of a product. We can change a customer's address. Um, we can change the quantity. Or if the customer decides to cancel their order, we don't lose the customer, we don't lose the product, we just lose the order line. Let's say they had, let's say order 1006 up here. We wanted to send the guy goes, calls up after he places his order. He goes, yeah, by the way, I really didn't want that writer's desk. Sorry. If we deleted that line in there, we'd lose the writer's desk. Here we could just loot nuke. Oops, I forgot. Forgot one underline. Here we just nuke this line and we we wouldn't lose the product. We wouldn't lose the customer. We wouldn't even lose the whole order. we just get rid of that one piece of the order. Therefore, each piece in here is now self-reliant. Its changes are in one place and only one place. Inserts are in one place. Deletes are in one place. Updates are in one place, which is the goal of a properly designed database is you want to do all your changes, whether it's add, update, or delete, in one place at a time. Realistically, if I'm adding a new order with a brand new customer, I would have to create a new customer, then create the order, then create the order line. But the thing is, notice, I'd have to create the customer. That's the change in one change in one place. Create the order, one change in one place. Create the order line, one change in one place. Whereas with that, I'd have to make three changes in one place, which is not good. Try that again. Yeah, the order and the order line, because the order ID is here. It is unique inside itself. Right in here, the order ID plus the product ID makes for a compound primary key. So remember last week, and I talked about intersection table and associative, and associative tables? 
this is an intersection table or actually an associative table because there's one extra attribute outside of the intersection. Yes, if I were to write that in relational math syntax, so if I were to gonna write that in as relational math, it would be like this. What am I, I was writing a word and it made no sense. Remember, I, was, I had that slide with the relational algebra on it. The combination of word ID plus PID determines quantity. You can't, de you cannot decompose the identifier or the determinant. Therefore, these two combined will always determine the quantity. These are also used elsewhere. So it, technically, if I were to draw this with one extra color for shits and giggles. Those are foreign keys. We don't talk about foreign keys when we're normalizing, but realistically, those are foreign keys. That's how it should have brown. <laughs> Might be hard to see from a distance. All right, hang on, let me try a different color so it's not black. There we go. Lime. So those are foreign keys. So I heard a question over there. No, that's that's one of the rules. Let me go. Back. Do not add data. Do not remove data. Do not add attributes, do not remove attributes. When you are normalizing, you have to use what is there, which is always one of the biggest issues students have. Is they're like, this makes no sense. I'm gonna create a surrogate key to fix my problem. No, you're not allowed to do that when you're normalizing. When you turn this into tables later, then you can start adding surrogate keys. This example is really good because it has surrogate keys in it. Product ID, customer ID, order ID. Those are surrogate keys, like they're being generated. So that's already fixed for, for whomever it is, but yes, you do not add data. I will be doing another one of these next week. Because you know what, if I did another one now, it wouldn't go in. I've learned in the past where I used to do two in one class and I get the questions about the second one at the start of the second class. I'm like, you know what? which is back to where I was talking about where either we cover normalization in one hour and a bit or over three day or over three lectures. Because we could spend a lot of time just discussing these different kinds of dependencies and stuff, but this is the gist of it. Anomalies and dependencies. All right. And that was almost the end. I usually try to keep my lecture on normalization to about an hour because realistically, most people's brains are melting at this point. Uh, so the summary is, the process of normalization is reversible. In theory, we could take this and bring it all the way back to that because we A, didn't add anything, B, we didn't delete anything. We can put it back the way it was. Nothing is lost, nothing is added, and it is now free from insert, update, and delete anomalies with this structure. And that was the last slide. <laughs> it's an interesting concept that's sometimes a little rough to understand at first. In Brightspace, you will notice in the week five lecture material, and I'll bring this up really quick for you guys. Hang on, it's coming. Uh, you'll notice that there's a PDF 
normalization in simple English. Um, it is 14 pages long, but it does a much better job than the textbook. Um, it covers, it actually uses very similar data to this. And it talks about all the different anomalies. It talks about how you'd break down that first table into its component pieces. So it goes through it in fairly simple English. It's never going to be simple English, but it's as close simple English as we can make it. All right.